Hi, everybody. I am Lissy with Family Strengths, and we are here today for our speaker series, Kids Crash, with Dr. Elena McAtee. Hopefully, I said your name right. You did. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much for joining us, and I will just pass it on over and let you take it away. We've got one more person jumping in now, it looks like. All right. Wait. <clears throat> okay. So like Lizzie mentioned, my name is Elena McAtee. I am a family medicine doctor, newer here to Los Alamos, uh, working at um, Manum, Medical Associates of Northern New Mexico here in town. And today I'm going to be talking about um, common injuries in children and appropriate care and when to know whether or not medical care is advised. So my hope for this talk um, is really to give you an idea, but always to emphasize that medical care, when in doubt, is always the right choice. No one is going to fault you for um, taking your child in. Children are very different than adults, and it's very hard to sometimes perceive the, de uh, the degree of injury. Um, so if in doubt, take them into the doctor, um, take them to an urgent care, to the emergency room, whatever you think is appropriate. Um, so I'll start by telling you a little bit about my main squeezes here. You'll see pictures of Lila. Um, my youngest, she's about two and a half, and Miles, um, our oldest child, who is about four and a half years old. Um, you'll see my husband here, Robert. I have to give him a shout out because he helped me with some pointers for this talk. He's an ER doctor who primarily works at uh, Presbyterian in Española. So um, I appreciated his input because I know he sees a lot of injuries of children, more so than I do in practice. Um, so also with kids, I think, um, <laughs> especially with my kids, I feel this constant balance between challenging their motor skills, as well as trying to prevent in an injury. And so I think, um, I think we all have that tendency to like want to put our kid in a bubble to protect them. Um, but we can't always do that. And we don't always want to do that. Um, and so in that way, prevention, like wearing helmets, putting on sunscreen, um, having discussions about potential risk associated with different activities um, are always really important. And so, you know, proper gear in different sports, all of that. So, so we can't keep our kids in bubbles, but we can do things to modify their risk. Um, and uh, that's very important. So uh, I'll talk about a couple of injuries that Miles has actually injured uh, throughout his life, um, throughout the, the talk. So you'll get an idea by looking at his beautiful smile and, and he's missing one of his front teeth um, prematurely. So we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more in, in the future of this talk. Um, so today we're gonna focus on different injuries that are common in children. Um, we'll primarily be looking at wounds, extremity injuries, tooth injuries, head injuries, eye injuries, bison stings, environmental exposures, and ingestions. Um, let's see. Yeah. And we're going to talk about each one of these, about different first aid things, and again, what to look for, that, uh, the keys that may indicate medical care is needed. So let's get started here with lacerations and abrasions. Um, so lacerations are deeper than abrasions. Whenever I think of an abrasion, I think of, oops, um, this picture on the right of scraped knees. You can see that this injury is much more superficial than this other on the left. Um, the major, an, another major difference is that here uh, with this laceration, you'll see some minor gaping. So the wound is slightly opened. Um, and it looks like it could be pulled together um, to close. What will happen when you have a wound that's gaping like this is that you're going to get secondary healing that may result in more scarring. So if this wound here isn't pulled together, isn't closed, somehow um, you have a higher risk of scarring. Um, so 
the proper first aid uh, for any wound in general is going to be to clean it. Um, soap and water typically do. You can also use chlorhexidine, which is considered like a surgical scrub. You can find it over the counter. It's typically in a blue uh, bottle or like greenish blue bottle. It's very helpful. It doesn't sting the wound. Um, and so if you can't access chlorhexidine, I really think soap and water is just fine. You know, just get, get that wound clean as quickly as possible. After you do that, you're going to want to inspect the area, um, identifying if it's superficial, deep, again, if gaping is present, um, it, uh, you want to inspect where it's located. So in general, if you have a wound um, along a joint line, um, that seems like it could be deep enough to actually penetrate the joint, or if you see fatty tissue coming out of the laceration, um, or if muscle is involved, um, anything like that, you know, you, you know that you have a more severe laceration that goes deeper. Um, and then I would request that you reflect on what is the surface that has caused the wound? So is it the road? Is it a rusted nail? Um, did an animal cause it? Um, was there broken glass? Could there be some pieces of foreign bodies still within the wound? Um, and after you do that, you can identify whether or not you need medical care a little bit more easily. So if you have a wound that you feel like you can't stop the bleeding, you're applying pressure for about five minutes, it's still bleeding, you're you know, considering taking them in, just go ahead and do it. It sounds like at that point, you're not going to be able to apply skin glue or another um, adhes uh, adhesive, skin adhesive to close a wound uh, enough to where the bleeding stops. So go ahead and take them in um, at that point. If it's very deep, gaping, if it's long, if the edges are uh, irregular or jagged, they're not gonna heal well. So you'll likely need um, uh, some sutures for that wound. Um, if range of motion is impacted, again, if you have an issue where you feel like you can see nerve, um, bone, if the range of motion is, it, um, you know, if you feel like they can't actually move their finger, um, or a joint because of the injury, um, that's uh, sometimes a clue as well. We talked about the foreign body and whether or not it, it would, it's dirty. One of the other things to consider with that, uh, especially with the rusted surface, is whether or not they've had their tetanus shot. So generally speaking, if they've completed their tetanus primary series, which is about three vaccines when you're young, um, and then, um, and and it's been greater. Oh, so, so, so if they've completed their tetanus series and it's been more than five years, or if they've had their booster when they were, they're a teenager, um, and it's been more than five years, they'll likely need a tetanus vaccination. Um, so another reason to seek medical care. I'll talk a little bit about facial lacerations. Um, this is really a two point, um, discussion about facial lacerations. One, is that in child, we're more concerned about scarring because they're gonna to have to live with it for the rest of their life. And so if you were going to suture that laceration up, um, you're gonna want it, you, you're gonna to want to suture it rather than just put a skin adhesive over it because you're gonna have better cosmetic results. Um, and also um, a lot of different areas of the face cross different lines. So you have the area of your lip, you have your eyebrow, uh, where symmetry of the wound is very important. And that's going to be accomplished best by suturing rather than skin glue or adhesive um, skin material. So, um, and then here on the right side of this slide, you'll see the um, issue, the common scenarios whenever uh, first aid at home is sufficient. So reviewing first aid for wounds, again, rinse with soap and water. You're not going to, I'm going to emphasize this point, alcohol and hydrogen peroxide are commonly used. I see this all the time. Um, you know, people feel that they have to disinfect the wound with something that's more potent, um, but that's not the case. We know with numerous studies of wound care that soap and water do the job just uh, as well, you know, as far as preventing infection as alcohol and hydrogen peroxide. Um, what the hydrogen peroxide and alcohol can do is actually cause surrounding tissue damage 
And so you're going to get a delayed healing or you're actually going to have extension of the wound. Um, so shy away from those um, immediately. Just use your soap and water. The other thing that I see commonly uh, used is Neosporin. I feel like Neosporin has done a really good job throughout the years of advertising its use to um, in, encourage wound healing. However, um, there is a hypersensitivity, hypersensitivity reaction that some people will experience. And I see this a whole lot where you'll actually get more redness and more itchiness associated with the wound. And what studies show is that can delay wound healing. So I, I like, I prefer plain old Vaseline um, for wounds. Your body will take care of uh, most of that bacteria on its own and using the soap and water initially will help cleanse the wound and any bacteria that may have um, had implanted with the actual, um, the trauma. So you can use Faxitracin, which is an over-the-counter antibiotic um, ointment. I like that one. It doesn't have the same issues as Neosporin, um, but if you feel like it needs something, you can apply that. Um, using a bandage is very useful, especially if you have a wound that is bleeding or that you feel like is at risk for bleeding, um, for re-bleeding. So for example, if you have something on the elbows or on the knees, uh, on, on the hands, hands are a difficult one because you're constantly washing your hands, but those areas um, can use a little bit more protection and you can actually put some Vaseline on the inside to keep the wound moist and to, um, to help it heal. Uh, if you have a kid who likes to pick at their wounds a lot, again, picking at it, we all know will cause scars. So um, you can use something along that. If you have someone who's sensitive to adhesives or band-aids, you can watch them carefully or take the route of using a gauze wrap around the wound and then just like taping it um, and, and holding it in place that way. So, so there's ways around using adhesives directly on the skin, which is um, always something I try to remember. Um, do use ice and elevation. I think that's um, underrated and especially in children when we don't have a lot of options for giving them pain medication um, or we try in general to shy away from that, um, using ice and elevation is hugely helpful. Um, we talked, to, I talk, I've mentioned a, a few times skin glue and dairy strips or skin adhesives. Uh, these can definitely be considered for straightforward wounds. I like them a lot. You know, we, we definitely have them in our first aid kit here at home. Um, but you have to know that you may not get the best cosmetic results. So if you are using them, just consider where the wound is and whether or not you're okay with having maybe a slightly bigger scar than what you otherwise would have with sutures. All right. So I'll talk a little bit about wounds that are caused by bites. In general, um, most of wounds caused by bites will need medical care um, because there's such a high, excuse me. <laughs> um, so there's such a high risk of um, infection with these, these wounds. So cat and human bites, especially, um, they will carry a lot of bacteria. And so it can quickly become an infection. Um, and so you're never, yeah, you're never wrong for taking them into the doctor if they've been bit by an animal or by another human and, and, the, and the wound is especially deep. Um, you also have to consider the vaccination status of the animal. So if the child is bit by a stray, um, you're gonna wanna contact animal control. If it's bit by another dog, you know, you need to, need to know the vaccination status as far as rabies are concerned. Um, so animal control may need, may need to be involved with that. All right, so moving on to extremity issues. We talked about fractures, sprains, and strains here. Um, fractures are not to be confused, or I'm um, sorry, rather, fractures are the same thing as broken bones. And you'll see here on the right side of the screen, I've put in a few pictures of possible different fractures. Um, and you, on the top, you can see these are going to be less severe. So non-displaced fracture versus something that's um, displaced will require different medical care. But regardless, you do want to get these checked out. Uh, and the big things to look for 
are if um, you're having like acute swelling, um, severe pain over the, the spot that's concerned, you know, pain to, to touch uh, is a big one. Any deformity, so if you can run your hand over it and feel a bump, um, that sometimes can indicate that you have a fracture. Um, if range of motion is inhibited, you know, that's a big one, getting the kid to just like range of motion a little bit to discern whether or not there's a fracture. Um, inability to bear weight if, if, it's, if the injury is to the lower extremity, um, that tells you a lot. If they can't bear weight immediately after an injury, that's reason for an x-ray. Um, and if the kid is just avoiding using it, so if it's upper extremity um, and they're not wanting to, to use their right arm after an injury, then that's a pretty good clue you need to evaluate for an x-ray. Um, I meant to mention this prior to discussing, discussing the fractures, but my, my son, actually, my four and a half year old son, um, when he was about two year, uh, yeah, about two or three, he actually had a fall while he was visiting his grandparents. And we didn't know the severity. I, I don't think anyone knew the severity. Um, we, we assumed that it was like any other injury that he was going to whine about it a while and then it would um, eventually go away. Well, two weeks later, we finally took him in to get an x-ray because the whining um, wasn't, he wasn't stopping, you know, it was becoming a bigger issue. And so we finally took him in and he ended up having a fracture of his collarbone. And luckily it was not displaced and no treatment would have been required. But um, it was a good reminder uh, to have a low threshold for taking your, taking your child in or evaluating with an x-ray. Uh, we didn't feel a deformity. There wasn't bruising. There was tenderness. Um, and certainly the injury seemed severe enough to where it was impacting his day-to-day -day functioning. Um, but uh, we just, we, we were resistant for whatever reason, and uh, we certainly regretted it and felt, felt bad. I mean, it happens to everyone. I think, you know, everyone knows someone who has a story that's similar to that, but we all should remember that x-rays are easy <laughs> and um, don't hesitate to, to get the child evaluated. All right, so, um, with any extremity injury, doing first aid is always good. So you can see on this diagram, um, the main things. So we call this rice therapy, rest, ice, compression, elevation, always good, no matter what the, uh, extremity issue is for sprains and strains. So if, like, for example, what we call it twisted ankle, um, you know, you may have some swelling, um, but you definitely want to start doing gentle range of motion, keeping the foot or the extremity or the joint immobilized, so not moving it, has actually been shown to increase uh, recovery time. So moving it gently um, against gravity or just with stretches is, is good. And you can just recommend that uh, as tolerated. All right, so I'm only gonna briefly talk about tooth injuries. There's a whole host of tooth injuries and children actually are, this is a pretty common injury. I think about um, one in four or one in five ch children will experience um, a tooth injury uh, of especially like their temporary teeth. Um, another tidbit on my son, Sweet Miles, um, he was about 18 months old. He had a slip in the bathtub despite both my husband and I being present for uh, that bath <laughs> and he hit his tooth against the side of the bathtub and actually had a pretty significant chip to his tooth. We took him into the dentist who informed us that although the tooth was okay at that time, it had a high likelihood of turning into an infection. And uh, within six months, we were back at the dentist and he ultimately had his tooth pulled. Um, and so you saw that picture of him on the front uh, at the start of the, of the presentation. So. Um, it happens a lot. It's common. I think, um, again, you kind of have to allow it to uh, allow yourself to, to know that it is common. So that way you don't get too worked up about it. Um, but in general, if you have a tooth injury, you're going to want to seek medical or a dental care. Um, if you have a loss of a permanent tooth, um, this is like the tricky thing. Like people, uh, you know, you have a, uh, a tooth that's come out, what do I do? You know, if it's completely like where you can see the root, the entire tooth is out, you can try to place it back in its place. 
And so um, you want to do that as quickly as possible. You have pretty good success rates if you do that within an hour. You'll take the tooth, um, handle it by the crown, try not to touch the root, um, uh, and uh, rinse it with cold water, reposition it in the mouth, and have the child bite down on a washcloth, um, and that should get it to stick. If you can't get it to stick, um, if for whatever reason you can't re-implant the tooth, you can place it in pasteurized milk until you're able to see the dentist. But again, this is a reason to call the online dentist, um, get an immediate appointment if possible, um, or sorry, on-call dentist if it's say, for example, over the weekend. Um, but yeah, it, it's there's hope. Um, there's hope, especially if you're able to move quickly and take the right steps. Okay, so I'll, I'll touch base on head injuries. Um, so head injuries happen a lot, um, and it's always important to know that no one is, is going to, if you're concerned, take the kid in. If they're acting differently, if they're confused, lethargic, agitated, if they're slow to respond to you, if they're repeating questions, if they're just not themselves, um, take them in to be evaluated. If there was any loss of consciousness, you're definitely going to want to, to get medical care. Um, you can consider a severe mechanism um, of a fall greater than three feet for a child that's less than two years old and greater than five feet for a child who's greater than two years old. So if they've fallen and they're acting normal, but they have this mechanism of falling from a, a high uh, place, um, it's good to get them evaluated and potentially just observed within the medical setting. Um, and then I'll just touch base and put a little emphasis on prevention here because I feel like it's so important to have children wearing helmets for any activity that they're doing on wheels, such as riding a scooter, um, um, riding their bicycle, uh, head injuries in general are considered preventable to a certain degree. And so recognizing that um, and also recognizing the long term effects of head injuries. Um, not only just when they're a child, but as they get older uh, with the higher rates of, of uh, people who have injured multiple head injuries, having certain types of dementia um, and illnesses, it's, it's really, it's, it's one of those things, it's just a shame if we're not having our children wear helmets to protect their, their potential future. All right, so talk about eye injuries. With this one, not much to say because most of the time you need medical care. If you have an exposure to a substance, you know, for example, they're playing with vinegar and baking soda and some of it gets in their eye. The first thing you're going to want to do is rinse their eye. Um, running it under water for several minutes is usually the way to do. And then you'll be able to tell with the degree of pain or redness whether or not from that you need to seek medical care. Um, but in general, if there's a trauma to the eye, if you're concerned that they had a scratch to their cornea, um, if you're concerned that they're having eye pain, anything like that obviously needs further examination with um, a medical professional. Um, okay, so I'll talk some about bites and stings. Really common. Most of the time, it's okay and first aid can be given, but the most important thing to remember is if they have anaphylactic-like symptoms or anaphylaxis, um, they need immediate care. And uh, anaphylaxis is defined as two or more organ system reaction. So if you look at this, this picture here, um, you can have maybe wheezing and swelling of their eyes or their lips. Um, that's reason to go in to the, or that's reason to call 911. Um, if they have vomiting, uh, if they have swollen lips and vomiting, you know, take them, uh, call, call 911, take them to the ER, whichever can get them the EpiPen the fastest. So I'll emphasize calling 911 in this event because you want to get them the EpiPen as quickly as possible. You want to, um, you know, in this, you just don't want to delay. You want to, you want to, uh, because it can quickly progress, um, whatever can get them the care with the EpiPen, um, the fastest you'll want to do. Um, of course, in the event that they don't have these severe reactions, you can do ice, you can do an antihistamine like Benadryl, or um, Zyrtec, whatever you have on hand. Um, and that will take care of a lot of the swelling and pain associated with the bite or sting. 
if the stinger is present for from for instance a, a, a bee a bee sting or hornet or whatever you're going to want to remove it with tweezers so that way it'll um, hopefully remove some of the toxin with that if you have a tick bite and the tick is still present on the skin the correct way to remove that in attempt to remove the entire tick at the same time is with tweezers. So even though you want to remove it as quickly as possible when you see it, um, take the time, grab the tweezers and carefully remove the tick. All right, um, talking about snake bites. So most commonly in New Mexico, you're going to see rattlesnakes and bites with rattlesnakes are uh, rattlesnakes are, are toxic poisonous with a um, toxin that um, is toxic to your tissue. And that's the same case for copperheads. Although copperheads, I understand, aren't in our area, that's more found in more tropical areas. So if you're traveling to Texas or maybe to the Southeast, you'll have to be aware of that, um, uh, as well as water moccasins. But these snakes have what's called a tissue toxin. So the tissue um, is going to be impacted more um, if you tourniquet. So if you tourniquet, it's going to concentrate, thereby making the potent potency of the toxin greater, and therefore the, um, the damage to the skin or to the tissue is going to be more. Um, whereas um, uh, the coral snake, again, not found here in our area, but if you're traveling elsewhere, you may encounter this. The coral snake, um, has a neurotoxin. So you actually do want to uh, tourniquet because you don't want it to spread elsewhere to, for example, your, your um, central nervous system. So key is most snakes around here uh, are gonna be rattlesnake um, if they're poisonous and, and you're not gonna wanna tourniquet that. Um, if you, uh, always elevation. So if you're on the way to the ER, elevate, um, don't try to suck out the poison um, that may actually introduce more bacteria um, to the wound. Um, if you're not sure of the type of snake, take a picture. Poison control can actually help you identify whether or not it is a poisonous snake and whether or not you need further medical care. So a huge resource I feel like is not as well known about regarding poison control is that they can help identify snakes. If in doubt, go to the ER, they can get you the care that you need. Environmental exposures. Um, so lots of, uh, of poison, poison ivy and oak around here. Um, the identification, you know, you think of the, the red stem with three leaves uh, for, for the poison ivy, poison oak um, also has three leaves. If you identify an exposure, um, a lot of times you won't see an immediate reaction, but if you know that you've had an exposure or potential exposure, washing with actually like a dishwashing soap um, can help take off the toxin from your skin, which will then reduce the reaction later on. Um, also, you can apply steroid creams, do cool compresses, oatmeal baths, which all may help soothe the area and reduce the potential for worsening of the reaction. Um, antihistamines, of course, like Zyrtec and Benadryl. Um, in general, if, you're, if you've had a large exposure or you have a severe reaction to where you're having blistering or oozing, that's... The, a pretty good sign that you're going to need steroid therapy, either orally or by injection. And so at that point, you're going to need medical care. Also with these, you're, you're at risk for developing a second infection because once the skin is broken, that leaves room for the bacteria to come in and that can cause um, an infection. Um, so briefly, sunburns also really common here uh, with us being at such high altitude. Um, biggest thing is obviously prevention, wearing protective clothing as well as sunscreen. But if you do have an injury with sunburn, aloe vera is helpful as well as hydration. Um, ingestions, not much to say about this other than providing the poison control number available 24 hours a day, definitely able to tell you whether or not you need medical care in these circumstances. So, um, 
that's it. Uh, I'll finish by saying prevention is key. I think I'd emphasize this a lot. Um, we, you know, if you have that mommy gut feeling of, hmm, this could potentially cause injury, think about how you can modify it to where it's not as high of a risk for the child. Um, also educating children on why we're telling them not to do certain activities or, or things um, as far as their risk for potential injury um, is also key. They, they, they understand, I think, more than, than what we sometimes give them credit for. So um, talking with them about why you're um, making certain recommendations or preventing them from doing certain things is key. Uh, and my entire talk, you know, I think most importantly, when in doubt, seek, seek medical care. We, we are never going to be faulted um, for reaching out to a medical professional. Um, it's a small, small price to pay for the wellness of our children. Um, and I think as parents, even as a medical professional, you know, both my husband and I, we get caught up in this sort of like inability to objectively think about our children and sometimes having that objective opinion by someone outside of your family is very important. So don't hesitate if in doubt to seek uh, medical care. All right, that's all I have. So I, I welcome any questions or further discussion. Everything's good. All right, wonderful. Thank um, you. Everyone. I was wondering about um, oh, sorry, um, spiders. Uh -huh. About spider, like um, like black widow or um, like widows and that kind of thing. Like, or is that is there any difference with spiders with bites, or is it the so, same general guidelines? Yeah. So yeah, that's a good point. So I didn't talk about spiders, and if I do this to talk again, I can certainly add that in. Um, but yeah, spiders in general, the biggest thing that we're going to see with spider bite is a secondary infection and thereby like swelling and redness associated with that black widows. Um, you know, uh, I have to look that up. I don't want to quote anything and, and give you wrong information, um, specifically about the toxin of the black widow and what you can look for. I, I don't want to comment on that without looking it up a little bit more. But um, yeah, the biggest thing with, in general with spiders is secondary infection. Yes, I Kate. I know you can see me, I'm raising my hand. Um, I wanted to thank you for that last thing you said that um, about you know when in doubt, go in or, or call in that there's, it's true, there's like an immense amount of guilt, I guess you can call it, of like not knowing whether it's the right thing to do to go in or not. And sometimes, you know, some providers or, or other people can make a parent feel guilty. Um, but I just, I just really appreciate that you put that out there in that way that it's, it's long-term, uh, like looking at the long-term um, effects of what could potentially be going on. And also just having another perspective that, you know, parents are superhumans, but we're not that's guild in all things and it's just nice to hear you say that it was a great presentation thank you um thank you. i also had i just i the alcohol and hydrogen peroxide um mm -hmm. thing was new to me that's really interesting that like you're not supposed to disinfect you know right away with those things and that that slows the healing process that was that was really interesting mm -hmm. um so when you say soap and water um would there be any potential like soaps can run you know the whole gamut from like completely natural and really just soap to like having all kinds of like perfumes and additives and things like that so i guess my question is would there be a, a detriment to using any is it any type of soap um if you don't have like a super natural one on hand is it okay to use like super perfumey or something like that or would that mm -hmm. potentially cause yeah. So we think about soaps killing bacteria by penetrating their plasma membrane. And so um, it's it, the sudsy effect that soaps give is good enough. So there, I know there's antibacterial soaps and there, there's 
non-antibacterial soaps, but really in general, all soap, um, if it has that sudsy effect, will penetrate uh, bacteria and, uh, and kill bacteria. So any, any soap is fine. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thank you for that question. I don't know why this isn't like part of birth classes, like this kind of information. I lived in Texas with all the other snakes. My dad had a coral snake jump at him and I wouldn't have known to put a tourniquet on it if he'd gotten bitten. Yeah. yeah. So it's that's really, that's really cool to know. I had no idea. So I will be sure to tell my dad, put a tourniquet on it if you get yeah. bit by a coral snake. It's like one of those things though, in the moment, you know, um, it's hard to remember like, oh, okay, you know, we all know that phrase, like um, uh, red on yellow, kill a fellow or yeah, red on yellow, kill a fellow. Um, but it's like in the moment, who's going to remember that? So it's, a, it's just a tidbit of information. And if you can remember it, great. If not, get to the ER. Awesome. Anybody else have any questions? I really appreciated this. And I know a lot of like a lot of people that I had invited couldn't make it um, live. So I'll be sure to be sending out the YouTube link as soon as it's able or it's available. Awesome. Yeah, I will try and get it posted on Thanks. Facebook today. Um, but Facebook doesn't like to post videos in a timely fashion. So even if I click the button today, it may not actually happen till tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you all. And thank you, Lizzie, for um, asking me to speak about this. I thought, I thought the topic was just great. Um, so yeah. it was nice for me to review and uh, I hope to be able to give it again in the future. And, and uh, I already have thought That's of some things to include, um, including the spider bites. So um, awesome. I appreciate Let's it. And if anyone has feedback of what they want to want to hear next time, certainly pass cool. that along. Let's plan on an in-person next year. Okay. <laughs> Sounds good. Okay. Thank you. Awesome. I'm going to stop the recording.